I don't think there's anyone you're going to talk to who's going to have a worse day than when you have to lay off employees in mass. I went from 120 people, 92 of which were full-time employees, and the balance were contractors. Uh, so I went from 122 to 38 in one day. Ooh. That was not fun. But I think I need to back up a little bit and describe how I got there because really what happened is I made every single mistake you could make uh, in starting a company. So the problem is when we're in bull markets in the tech market, um, like we are now, I believe, you tend to drink your own Kool-Aid, right? Like you just believe the hype. Everyone tells you how great you are. So I was picked by Time Magazine as one of the hot three tech companies in Europe. I had a dot matrix in Wall Street Journal. Uh, I was on the front cover of the Top Venture Capital Magazine. Uh, I was invited to the private wine cellars of Bernard Arnault, uh, LVMH. And, you know, everyone, like Goldman Sachs invested and told me we would IPO in a year and a half for a billion dollars. And it's very easy to believe all that and lose your fundamentals. So what are the mistakes I made? I raised way too much money too quickly. And I always warn people against doing that. Uh, I didn't really have what people now call product market fit. We didn't have that term back then, but I didn't have it. I didn't really know what my customer base wanted. By raising too much money, I had all these investors with really big expectations of outcome. So I felt like I was in a rush to do everything. Um, the second thing I did because I raised too much money is I hired too many employees. So we just went out and got as many talented as people as we could. And everyone wanted to join a startup back then, kind of like now. And so, the third mistake I made is I hired everyone who looked like me. Seth Sternberg of Mebo uh, said short people like to hire short people and tall people like to hire tall people. And, you know, I think he's half joking. But listen, you know, I hired a lot of people who had very similar backgrounds to me. And it really takes diversity of people to build a company. Um, I also thought that it should be a meritocracy because I came from consulting. And I, the kind of consulting I did originally was building software, so I was actually building stuff. Um, but Anderson Consulting, it's now Accenture, was kind of a meritocracy. It was like a bunch of smart people that got in a room and tried to decide on things. Companies don't work well as meritocracies. I think hierarchy and, and, and ability to make rapid decisions matters a lot. Um, I built too many products. I built four products all at the same time. And we just thought we needed to be in all parts of the supply chain. We were creating collaboration software, document management, editing, mock-ups, workflow for large-scale engineering construction projects. And so we thought we had to have an e-commerce engine and a collaboration engine and a supplier management portal and all this stuff, right? We built good stuff, we just built too much. And the problem is you end up going uh, you know, a mile wide and an inch deep and nothing is sophisticated enough. And, and people don't understand this, which is you build all this code and then you constantly get requirements to maintain it and to edit it. And then you stop innovating because you have too wide of software. Um, I was a little too uh, much in the press too early. And that was a big problem because we struggled to meet the expectations that we had set in the marketplace. I thought, if someone else gets out before me, then they're going to get all the press and I'm never going to get press and I want to be the company everybody knows, right? But the problem with getting press too early is if your company's not ready for it, then you struggle internally to try to keep up with that. And if you disappoint or don't meet expectations, you can't rebuild that kind of trust with the market. So, you know, I look at everything I did as a mistake. Uh, I'd say another big mistake I made, I mean, really, just they should write a textbook on the mistakes I made. Uh, I, I, um, I took strategic money, and I like to say strategic money is an oxymoron. Okay. And, and here's what I mean is uh, most strategic investors, which means industry money, are not that strategic. And they tell you that they're going to help you, but the, the person in some corporate office does the deal with you which doesn't mean that every business unit suddenly wants to work with you. And often they resent being told to work with you. So sometimes they kind of fight back against it. But the bigger problem was they didn't think like venture capitalists. So when markets got difficult and we had to cut costs, they didn't want to cut because they wanted us to produce more product. Um, if I was moving in a direction that wasn't synergistic with what their business wanted, you know, they were wanting to stop me from doing that. They put in clauses about who we could sell the company to, who we couldn't sell the company to. Um, and, you know, I found it very destructive. So, gosh, 
um, I can't think of a single mistake I didn't make. And, and it was really dark days, but I'll just tell this one story that I really haven't told much publicly, but we, the final mistake I made was um, believing that you could take early stage companies and merge them together to survive, right? The idea was, well, you have some cash, we have some cash, we're in complementary businesses, we could merge the company together, lay off some staff and become a, a you know, a, a profitable business. But mergers in early stage companies are so distracting. And I think what they really, it's a, it's a warning sign for me as an investor. If I see someone trying to make a bunch of acquisitions when they're a young company, it either means the core business isn't working or the CEO is a deal junkie. And it's usually a bit of both. And so um, we thought that's how we were going to survive. And so we were going to merge with a company called Icecraper. Everything was agreed. Their CEO agreed. Our investors agreed. Their investors agreed. We were just about ready to start the legal documents. And the day before, their investor pulled out and gave them money directly. And I think they gamed me. They took me right up to the point where I had no more money, and then they funded their company as a way to drive me out of business. And that was pretty terrible. So when that happened, um, I called my top eight or nine people, and we hadn't paid ourselves in like six months. Like We paid our staff, but like the top team didn't pay ourselves for a long time because we wanted investors to know how much we respected their money and, and the fact that we were trying to make this company survive. And we all went to a pub. It was like at noon in the UK. And I guess that's more acceptable in the UK. But we all went to a pub. We all ordered a pint of beer. And I said, OK, guys, we need to start planning for bankruptcy. And we literally had the planning meeting. How would we go through it? How would we shut down the company? When are we going to tell the press? When are we going to tell employees? Who's going to deal with the legal documentation of it all? And right before that happened, uh, you know, we were in the midst of the meeting, my phone rang and I went out and it was my investor saying, look, we understand this happened, don't lose your confidence. We will find a way to get through this. And we did. And they pulled together some money, you know, some of my other investors kicked in some money. And that's when I ended up firing a bunch of staff and running on a lean budget. But from there on in, which was 2001, I don't think I made too many more mistakes. And what I like to say is I was a depression era baby. You know, like people from the depression still save paper clips because they just they know what it was like to film their, you know, like starvation. Um, you know, I started flying back of the plane everywhere I went. I started staying in the cheapest hotels I could stay at. I would fly at off hours to get cheaper flights. I would I mean, we moved into the grottiest offices we could find. And it almost became a culture where we were cheap almost for the point of it. I think. Too many people are afraid to admit to their personal frailties. I mean, every, every successful person you meet or read about in the press, trust me, they have dark days too. Uh, even, you know, billionaires have dark days. And I think there are groups like there's something called YPO, Young Presidents Organization. What YPO does really well, and I wish entrepreneurs would form similar groups, they have something called Forum. And Forum is, I think it's eight members who meet on a regular basis. They actually have facilitators come in and they get you to talk about your life. You're not allowed to talk about work. And so in my forum, we talked about divorce. We talked about aging parents. We talked about infidelity. We talked about all these topics that everyone was dealing with. And, and it was, it's like a cone of silence thing. Like you can't tell anyone outside a forum, but I had never seen like other men. And, and in my forum, there didn't happen to be women, but there's many women in YPO but just opening up in the way that people opened up. And it was such a like relief for me. It's actually the reason I sold my company because um, I just never imagined I was gonna sell my company. It was my baby, right? Like I thought I created this thing, I'm gonna do this forever. And when I presented a forum and they heard how much money I'd raised, how diluted I got from raising so much capital, how many liquidation preferences I had above me, they said, look, Mark, the only thing that you have is your youth and your talent. And if you squander that on something, like you've done your duty to your investors. I stayed six years and they said, you've done your duty. And after that, I thought about life a lot. And I just like going back to start all over again was so like scary in a way. But I went to my investors and I said, I'll stay for a year. Um, I'll help you hire a new CEO. I'll do whatever you want. I'll transition, you can take all my, whatever you want, but we need to find someone else to run this. And I realized that I had run my course. And um, 
three weeks later, I moved from London back to Silicon Valley. I moved to Palo Alto. And uh, three weeks after that, had my second child and uh, started afresh, just put a flag and moved to Palo Alto. But really, to your question, it's everybody has doubts, secret doubts. Everybody, uh, even the most successful companies are secretly worried about their future. And um, I mean, think about Google, like the most successful company on earth, right? And you can imagine the dark days they had over should Eric Schmidt stay or leave, should Larry take over or not. Um, and, and if you haven't read the book Googled, you should read it. Ken Auletta wrote a brilliant book that talks about the tough decision to bring in Eric in the first place. They didn't want to bring him in. They had to have a, but here's, a, here's an idea for you. They had to have a personal coach. They had Coach Campbell come in and work with them once a week to meet with them to talk about how to get along. Because the single biggest thing that I think creates the most stress and problems in companies is dealing with the other human beings who run that company. And yet we don't bring in people to help us work on the human relation thing. And because tech startups in particular are built by super smart people who tend to be product-y, engineering-y kind of people, they maybe sometimes lack on the people skills. So try to get in a group of people. I used to go to lunch with other CEOs and I would just, I would always start by opening up. I would say, okay, here was my last valuation and here's my liquidation preferences. What happened to you guys? And, and people were like, well, we don't talk publicly about that. I'm like, I'm not a journalist. Back then I didn't write a blog, but you know, I'm, I'm not, it's not like I'm gonna tell people this, but wouldn't it be helpful to know, like how much do you pay recruiters and do you pay upfront fees and how much do you pay your head of engineering? And I just started opening up and I found the more open I was, the more open people were back. So, but getting a coach, being open, forming a group of people, and it has to be people outside your company. It can't be like, you can't open up to your staff that you have self-doubt, like that doesn't work.